Chapter six, the beginning of Uncle Andrew's troubles. Let go, let go, screamed Polly. I'm not touching you, said Diggory. Then their heads came out of the pool and once more, the sunny quietness of the wood between the worlds was all about them. And it seemed richer and warmer and more peaceful than ever after the staleness and ruin of the place they had just left. I think that if they had given the chance, they would again have forgotten who they were and where they came from and would have lain there and enjoyed themselves half asleep, listening to the growing of the trees. But this time, there was something that kept them as wide awake as possible. For as soon as they had got out onto the grass, they found that they were not alone. The queen, or the witch, whichever you like to call her, had come up with them, holding on fast by Holly's, Polly's hair. That was why Polly had been shouting, let go! And this proved, by the way, another thing about the rings, which Uncle Andrew hadn't told Diggory because he didn't know it himself. In order to jump from the world to world by one of those rings, you don't need to be wearing or touching it yourself. It is enough if you are touching someone who is touching it. In that way, they work like a magnet. And everyone knows that if you pick up a pin with a magnet and another pin, which is touching the first pin will come too. Now that you saw her in the wood, Queen Jadis looked different. She was much paler than she had been, so pale that hardly any of her beauty was left. And she was stooped and seemed to be finding it hard to breathe as if the air of that place was stifling her. Neither the children felt in the least afraid of her now. Let go, let go my hair, said Polly. What do you mean by it? Here, let go of her hair at once, said Diggory. They both turned and struggled with her. They were stronger than she. In a few seconds, they had forced her to let go. She reeled back, panting, and there was a look of terror in her eyes. Quick, Diggory, said Polly, changing rings and into the home pool. Help, help, mercy, cried the witch in a faint voice, staggering after them. Take me with you. You cannot mean to leave me in this horrible place. It is killing me. It's a reason of state, said Polly spitefully. Like when you killed all those people in your own world. Do be quick, Diggory. And they put on their green rings, but Diggory said, oh, bother. What are we to do? He couldn't help feeling a little sorry for the queen. Oh, don't be such a dolt, said Polly. Ten to one, she's only shaming. Do come on. And then both children plunged into the home pool. It's a good thing that we made that mock, thought Polly. But as they jumped, Diggory felt that a large cold finger and thumb had caught him by the ear. And as they sank down and the confused shapes of her own world began to appear, the grip of that finger and the thumb grew stronger. The witch was apparently recovering her strength. Diggory struggled and kicked, but it was not of the least use. And in a moment, they found themselves in Uncle Andrew's study. And there was Uncle Andrew himself staring at the wonderful creature that Diggory had brought back from beyond the world. And while he might stare, Diggory and Polly stared too. There was no doubt that the witch had got over her faintness. And now that one saw her in our own world with the ordinary things around her, she fairly took one's breath away. In Charn, she had been alarming enough. In London, she was terrifying. For one thing, they had not realized till now how very big she was. Hardly human was what Diggory thought when he looked at her. And he may have been right, for some say there's a giantish blood in the royal family of charm. But even her height was nothing compared with her beauty, her fierceness, and her wildness. She looked 10 times more alive than most of the people one meets in London. 
Uncle Andrew was bowing and rubbing his hands and looking, to tell the truth, extremely frightened. He seemed a little shrimp of a creature beside the witch. And yet, as Polly said afterwards, there was a sort of likeness between her face and his, something in the expression. It was a look that all wicked magicians have, the mark, which Jadis had said, she could not find in Diggory's face. One good thing about seeing the two together was that you would never again be afraid of Uncle Andrew any more than you'd be afraid of a worm after you have met a rattlesnake or afraid of a cow after you have met a mad bull. Pooh, thought Diggory to himself, hmm, magician, not much. Now she's the real thing. Uncle Andrew kept on rubbing his hands and bowing. He was trying to say something very polite, but his mouth had gone all dry so that he could not speak. His experiment with the rings, as he called it, was turning out more successful than he liked. For though he had dabbled in magic for years and always left all the dangers, as far as one can, to other people, nothing at all like this had ever happened to him before. And then Jada spoke not very loud, but there was something in her voice that made the whole room quiver. Where is the magician who has called me into the world? Uh, uh, Madame, gasped Uncle Andrew, I am the honored, uh, highly gratified, uh, most unexpected pleasure. If only I had had the opportunity of making any preparations, I, I. Where is the magician, fool? Said Janus. I. I am um, Madame. I hope you will excuse any uh, liberty these naughty children have taken. I assure you, there is, was no intention. You, said the Queen in a still more terrible voice. Then, in one stride, she crossed the room, seized a great handful of Uncle Andrew's gray hair, and pulled his head back so that his face looked up into hers. Then she studied his face, just as she had studied Diggory's face in the Palace of Charn. He blinked and licked his lips nervously all the time. And at last, she let him go, so suddenly that he reeled back against the wall. I see, she said scornfully. You are the magician of salt. Stand up, dog, and don't sprawl there as if you were speaking to your equals. How do you come to know magic? You are not of royal blood, I swear. Well, um, not perhaps in the strict sense, stammered Uncle Andrew. Not exactly royal, ma'am. The Kennelys are, however, a very old family. An old Dorsetshire family, ma'am. Peace, said the witch. I see what you are. You are a little peddling magician who works by rules and books. There is no real magic in your blood and heart. Your kind was made an end in my world a thousand years ago. <sighs> but here I shall allow you to be my servant. Oh, I should be most happy, delighted to be any of service. A pleasure, I show you. Peace! You talk far too much. Listen to your first task. I see we are in a large city. Procure for me at once a chariot or a flying carpet or, well, trained dragon or whatever usual for royal and noble persons in your land. Then bring me to places where I can get clothes and jewels and slaves fit for my rank. Tomorrow I will begin the conquest of the world. I'll, 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 I'll go and order a cab at once, grasped Uncle Andrew. Stop, said the witch, just as he reached the door. Do not dream of treachery. My eyes can see through walls and into the minds of men. They will be on you wherever you go. At the first sign of disobedience, I will lay such spells on you that anything you sit down on will feel like red hot iron. And whenever you lie in a bed, there'll be invisible blocks of ice at your feet. 
now go. The old man went out looking like a dog with his tail between his legs. The children were now afraid that Jadis would have something to say to them about what had happened in the wood. As it turned out, however, she never mentioned it either, then or afterwards. I think, and Diggory thinks too, that her mind was of sort of which cannot remember that quiet place at all. And however often you took her there and however long you left her there, she was still known nothing about it. Now that she was left alone with the children, she took no notice of either of them. And that was like her too. In Charm, she had taken no notice of Polly till the very end because Diggory was the one she wanted to make use of. Now that she had Uncle Andrew, she took no notice of Diggory. I expect most witches are like that. They aren't interested in things or people unless they can use them. They are terribly practical. So there was silence in the room for a minute or two, but you could tell by the way Jadis tapped her foot on the floor that she was growing impatient. Presently, she said as if to herself, what is the old fool doing? I should have brought a whip. She stalked out of the room in pursuit of Uncle Andrew without one glance at the children. Phew, said Polly, letting out a long breath of relief. And now I must get home. It's frightfully late. I shall catch it. Well, do, do come back as soon as you can, said Diggory. This is simply ghastly, have I here. You must make some sort of plan. That's up to your uncle now, said Polly. It was he who started all this messing about with magic. All the same, you will come back, won't you? Hang it all. You can't leave me here alone in the scrap like this. I shall go home by the tunnel, said Polly rather coldly. That'll be the quickest way. And if you want me to come back, hadn't you better say you're sorry? Sorry, exclaimed Diggory. Well, now, if that isn't just like a girl, what have I done? Oh, nothing, of course, said Polly sarcastically. Only nearly screwed my wrist off in that room with all the waxwork like a cowardly bully. Only struck the bell with the hammer like a silly idiot. Only turned back in the woods so that she had time to catch hold of you before we jumped into our own pool. That's all. Oh, said Degree, very surprised. Well, all right. I'll say I'm sorry. And I really am sorry what happened in the whack works room. There, I said I'm sorry. Now, do be decent and come back. I shall be in a frightful hole if you don't. I don't see what's going to happen to you. It's Mr. Kennelly who's going to sit on red hot chairs and have ice in his bed, isn't it? It isn't that sort of thing, said Diggory. What I'm bothered about is mother. Suppose that creature went into a room. She might frighten her to death. Oh, I see, said Polly in a rather different voice. All right, we'll call it a pax. I'll come back if I can, but I must go now. And she crawled through the little door into the tunnel and that dark place among the raptors, which had seemed so exciting and adventurous a few hours ago, seemed quite tame and homely now. We must now go back to Uncle Andrew. His poor old heart went pit-a-pat as he staggered down the attic stairs and he kept on dabbing at his forehead with a handkerchief. When he reached his bedroom, which was the floor below, he locked himself in. And the very first thing he did was to grope in his wardrobe for a bottle and a wine glass, which he always kept hidden there where Aunt Letty could not find them. He poured himself out a glass full of some nasty grown-up drink and drank it off at one gulp. And then he drew a deep breath. Upon my word. He said to himself, I'm dreadfully shaken, most upsetting at my time of life. And he poured out a second glass and drank it too. Then he began to change his clothes. You have never seen such clothes, but I can remember them. He put on a very high, shiny, stiff collar of the sort that made you hold your chin up all the time. He put on a white waistcoat with a pattern on it and arranged his gold watch chain across the front. He put on his best frock coat the one he kept for weddings and funerals. He got out of his best tall hat and polished it up. There was a vast flowers, put there by Aunt Letty, on his dressing table. He took one and put it in his buttonhole. He took a clean handkerchief, a lovely one such as you couldn't 
by today, out of his little left-hand drawer and put a few drops of scent on it. He took his eyeglass with a thick black ribbon and screwed it into his eye. Then he looked at himself in the mirror. Joe have one kind of silliness, as you know, and grown-ups have another kind. Now, at this moment, Uncle Andrew was beginning to be silly in a very grown-up way. Now that the witch was no longer in the same room with him, he was quickly forgetting how she had frightened him and thinking more and more of her wonderful beauty. He kept on saying to himself, I deem fine woman, sir, I deem fine woman, a superb creature. He had also somehow managed to forget that it was the children who had got hold of this superb creature. He felt as if himself by his magic had called her out of an unknown world. Andrew, my boy, he said to himself as he looked in the glass, you're a devilish well-preserved fellow for your age. A distinguished looking man, sir. You see, the foolish old man was actually beginning to imagine the witch would fall in love with him. The two drinks probably had something to do with it, and so had his best clothes. But he was, in any case, as vain as a peacock. That was why he had become a magician. He unlocked the door, went downstairs, sent the housemaid out to fetch a handsome, er, handsome, everyone had lots of servants in those days, and looked into the drawing room. There, as expected, he found Aunt Letty. She was busily mending a mattress. It lay on the floor near the window, and she was kneeling on it. Ah, Letitia, my dear, said Uncle Andrew, I uh, have got to go out. Just lend me five pounds or so. There's a good gel. And gel was the way he pronounced girl. <sighs> no, Andrew Dow, said Aunt Letty in her firm, quiet voice without looking up from her work. I've told you times without number that I will not lend you money. And now pray don't be troublesome, my dear Joe, said Uncle Andrew. It's most important. You'll put me in a disably awkward position if you don't. Andrew, said Aunt Letty, looking him straight in the face. I wonder you are not ashamed to ask me for money. There was a long, dull story of grown-up kinds behind these words. All you need to know about it is that Uncle Andrew with what managing dear Letty's business matters for her, never doing any work and running up large bills for brandy and cigars, which Aunt Letty had paid again and again, had made her a good deal poorer than she had been 30 years ago. Oh, my dear Joe, said Uncle Andrew, you don't understand. I shall have some quite unexpected expense today. I have to do a little entertaining. Come now, don't be tiresome. And who, pray, are you going to entertain, Andrew? Asked Aunt Letty. Uh, a most distinguished visitor just has arrived. A distinguished fiddlesticks, said Aunt Letty. There hasn't been a ring on the bell for the last hour. And at that moment, the door was suddenly flung open. Aunt Letty looked round and saw with amazement that an enormous woman, splendidly dressed, with bare arms and flashing eyes stood in the doorway. It was the witch.